this morning that came even earlier and welcome to each of you who've taken your place in the circle on this day in which we've leapt ahead an extra hour and uh, been deprived of a little sleep and morning has come a little sooner than we tend to welcome it welcome as you take your place in this circle a circle where you have a place whether you have been here many times haven't been here in a long time or have never been here before. This circle in which we create with one another becomes spiritual community, spiritual community in which we have the opportunity to be with one another, to reflect on the wisdom of our tradition and the wisdom we receive from the natural world, from science, from literature, from the arts, and the wisdom we receive from one another's experience. We come into this circle knowing we have a place of belonging and we welcome those of you who are joining us online as well. You too have a place in this community in whatever ways you connect with us. We come into this circle in gratitude for the freedom to gather, for the freedoms that are ours in this land, and for the gift of this land to which many have come to make their home, the ancestral home of the peoples, the Cree peoples and the Métis peoples, our partners in Treaty 6. As we gather in the gift of this land, we also acknowledge that however it is that this has come to be home for us, deep in our hearts, we have the same longings. Deep in our veins, the same blood runs. The same hearts beat within us. And so we sing ourselves into this time and place, acknowledging amid all our diversity, our deep unity.
we light this candle this morning, as we come together as one people, not just one people who happen to be in this room at this particular time, but one people that are joined together by more than just our geography, our connection to the broader peace of this world, our connection to humanity, our connection to the animals and plants, our connection to the very earth herself. We come this morning uh, partway through a series in which we uh, began last week with a, with a time of exploring our identity as cosmic elemental creatures. We laid symbols on the table, as perhaps many of you did who were invited to choose a symbol in your lives that, that might remind you of that identity that you are one with every atom and element. And our symbols on the table remind us of our elemental cosmic identity. This morning we turn our attention to our human identity, what it is that makes us human, what it is that connects us as spiritual beings having this human experience together. As we've lit our candle, we recognize that this is a time where we open ourselves to all that connects us, to the light that shines within us all.
Now is the time for all ages, and I welcome anyone who wants to come and uh, hear a story this morning to come to the carpet. Good morning. I, um, I want to tell you um, a story this morning. It's called, Is There Really a Human Race? By Jamie Lee Curtis and Laura Cornell. And um, I, I think there's two meanings to the word race. I think there's the kind of race that you have, you know, when you are trying to run or swim or you know, when you're having a race to win, a race, a competition, or a human race, which is just a way of saying all humans together. So um, I'm wondering what the person in this story is thinking about the word human race. Let's just find out. Is there really a human race? Is it going on now all over the place? When did it start? Who said, ready, set, go? Did it start on my birthday? I really must know. Do I warm up and stretch? I think it's pretty funny uh, that he has a number. <clears throat> do I practice and train? Do I get, on my, do I get my own coach? Do I get my own lane? Do I race in the snow? Do I race in a twister? Am I racing my friends? Am I racing my sister? If the race is a relay, is dad on my team? And his dad and his dad? Well, you know what I mean. Is the race like a loop or an obstacle course? Am I a jockey or am I a horse? Is there pushing and shoving to get to the lead? If the race is unfair, will I succeed? Do some of us win? Do some of us lose? Is winning or losing something I choose? Why am I racing? What am I winning? Does all of my running keep the world spinning? If I get off track when I take the wrong turn, do I make my way back from mistakes? Do I learn? Wow, she's very tall. Is it a sprint? A dash to the end? Am I aware of the time that I spend? And why do I do it, the zillion yard dash? If we don't help each other, we're all going to crash. Or is it crash? Sometimes it's better not to go fast. There are beautiful sights to be seen when you're last. Shouldn't it be that you just try your best and that's more important than beating the rest? Shouldn't it be looking back at the end that you judge your own race by the help that you lend? So take what's inside you and make big, bold choices. And for those who can't speak for themselves, use bold voices. See what she's doing? She's singing to raise five cents a song to save the park. That's pretty cool. And make friends and love well, bring art to this place, and make the world better for the whole human race. So here's two people down in the corner. They're from two different religions, mm -hmm. and they're playing fish. Uh, he says, do you have any twos? And he says, go fish. <laughs> That's the end of the book. Just kind of a silly book, but I think that this is really great because uh, it helps us remember that every day doesn't have to just be about racing around to do the things that we do. Uh, are any of you ever um, like racing around trying to get ready for school? Yeah. Does that happen? 
like you're not quite ready, and there's always one more thing to grab or one more thing to do, and oh, wait. That happens to all of us. That happens to all of us when we get ready for work or when we get ready to come to church, or sometimes it doesn't always work out. But you know what? Racing around like that, when we remember that day after day, it's not just about, okay, today's just like yesterday, have to go to school, come home, do this, do that, that there are things to remember along the way that keep us from being in the kind of competition race and to connecting us more with the human race, like how we help each other and how we look back and help and do things that are important and love and create art and all that wonderful stuff that this book reminds us of. So I love that. It helps us remember the kind of human race that we want to remember and the kind that maybe doesn't matter quite so much. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows, who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. In one of the ways mysticism teaches, it teaches us something about who we are. May we find wisdom for our living. From the words of a 13th century mystic, Rumi, that Dale read for us, to the words of a 21st century scientist, in his writings, Journey of the Universe, Brian Swim, this is what he says. Our human odyssey began some six or seven million years ago with a population of perhaps 100,000 
chimp-like apes living near the center of Africa. Earth's climate was changing and drying out central regions of the African continent. The forests and their abundant foods were disappearing. In response to that crisis, the ancestral population adopted two very different strategies. One portion clung to the shrinking forests in order to maintain their way of life in the midst of a difficult environmental transition. But another group ventured into the open spaces of the savannas. They were ill-prepared for this move. Their highly developed skills for swinging through the trees amounted to nothing out there under the blazing sun where they were hunted by hungry predators of several different lineages, including wild dogs and great cats. Helping this new species struggle to survive was the emergence of new traits, principally the ability to move on two feet. The second major development was an increase in brain size. The first hominids had brains the size of an orange. By the time the brain had reached the volume of a grapefruit, humans had mastered the ability to make stone tools. And then, only six million years after those human primates had made their daring move into the savannas, brains reached the size of a melon. It was at that time that an entirely new adventure was about to begin. It was more than 50,000 years ago in Northeast Africa that some of these completely modern humans moved out of Africa altogether. Their population in Africa was probably as small as 5,000, and the departing group was even smaller, perhaps as few as 150 humans altogether. This small group crossed the Red Sea at the southern end to enter what's now the Arabian Peninsula. Some of their descendants worked their way along the coastlines of India. Others turned north into what's now Europe, where cave paintings remain in southern Spain and France. Eventually, they spread across the Euro-Asian continent, finally crossing the Bering Straits and moving down into the Americas. We'll never know the full story of their exodus and all its dramas and challenges. But what we do know is that a band of several hundred men, women, and children spread and multiplied through the centuries until this new African species was populating every continent and biome on the planet. What was it about these early humans that enabled such spectacular biological success? Well, here's one of the ways that question's been answered. Humans didn't get to where we are because we're super geniuses. It's not like the Xbox One was just invented out of the blue one day. It was an improvement upon the Xbox 360, which was an improvement upon earlier consoles, arcade machines, and computers, and backward onto the dawn of video games. In the same way, we didn't just invent our modern society by sudden inspiration. It's the result of 250,000 years of tinkering and improvement. This is where accumulation matters. It's called collective learning, the ability of a species to retain more information with one generation than is lost by the next. This is what has taken us in a few thousand years from stone tools to rocket engines to being able to have the Crash Course theme song as your ringtone. Progress. If there was collective learning in Homo ergaster, it was very slow and very slight. This may have been due to limitations on communication, abstract thought, group size, or just plain brain power. But over the next two million years, things started to pick up. Homo antecessor, Homo heidelbergensis, and the Neanderthals developed the first systematically controlled use of fire in hearths, the first blade tools, the earliest wooden and spears, the earliest use of composite tools, where stone was fastened to wood, all before Homo sapiens were ever heard of around 250,000 years ago. Neanderthals even moved into colder climates, where they were compelled to invent clothing. They used complex tool manufacture to produce sharp points in scrapers and hand axes and wood handles, and they improved their craft over time. While evolution by natural selection is a sort of learning mechanism that allows a species to adapt generation after generation, with a lot of trial and error, and death, collective learning allows for tinkering, adaptation, and improvement on a much faster scale with each generation and across generations without waiting for your genes to catch up. Anatomically similar Homo sapiens have been around for about 250,000 years, and throughout that time we've been expanding our toolkit from stone tools to 
shell fishing to trade and actual fishing, mining, and by 40,000 years ago we had art including cave images, decorative beads, and other forms of jewelry, and even the world's oldest known musical instruments, flutes carved from mammoth ivory and bird bones. All this stuff came about as a result of collective learning. As long as you have a population of potential innovators who can keep dreaming up new ideas and remembering old ones, and an opportunity for those innovators to pass their ideas on to others, you're likely to have some technological progress. These mechanisms are still working today. We've got over 7 billion potential innovators on this planet and almost instantaneous communication, allowing us to do so many marvelous things, including teach you about big history on the internet. Have you noticed that um, two things are happening in our evolution? We're getting taller and we're talking faster and faster and faster. <laughs> in one of the ways science teaches us something about who we are. A reading from the ancient texts of the Jewish and Christian traditions from the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more clever than any other wild animal that God had made. The serpent said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made clothes for themselves. Then God said, See, the man and the woman have become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now they might also reach out their hands and take from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. In one of the ways mythology teaches us something about who we are, may we find wisdom for our living. Several years ago, along with many colleagues in the United Church of Canada, I participated in a training event on anti-racism. We were invited from all across the country. We were a group of Canadians. Half of the participants were individuals from visible minorities and indigenous individuals. And the other half of us appeared to be Caucasian, European, settlers. We were divided into small interracial groups to tell each other our family stories as far, as far back as we could go in terms of what had been passed on to us. 
which led us to telling one another a common story about our immigrant past. All of us came to tell stories of migration, the migration of our ancestors. And as we talked with each other, we began to see the human story as a story of migration. We began to see that larger story that we are all Africans, that our human story is a story of common ancestry and shared history. And we've been learning the even longer story of our ancestry a story longer than the history of our particular species. We're recovering that cosmic story of our emergence from an inexplicable burst of light, from stardust and bacteria to be one of the expressions of life. Not the be-all and end-all. Not the epitome of creatures. Just the latest expression of life and probably not the last either. Science is teaching us that we're relative newcomers in this community of life, biologically, chemically, geologically, related to every living thing in our planet, including the planet itself, and that the only elemental difference between you and me and the rocks and the trees and the birds and the bees is the way in which oxygen and carbon and hydrogen and nitrogen are arranged in us. We're the Johnny-come-lately species who emerged in the primate world in a lineage of diverse ancestors. And we flatteringly have called ourselves homo sapiens, wise men and women, we're the only surviving expression of the hominids. And for various reasons, our particular species became the only human species to survive the evolutionary journey. We've been without other humans for the last 30,000 years since the extinction of the Neanderthals. But we're not without family. We share more than 98% of our DNA with our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, and the orangutans. But who are we, human cousins of these creatures? What does it mean to be a human being? And what do we, as one expression of primates, bring to the community of life? Maybe our mythologies reveal something more to us about what it means to be human. One of those mythologies is that story we love to hate. That story of a primal garden. That archetypal story that has been such a powerful tool of patriarchy and of fostering a kind of father-knows-best tribal god. But that story still holds some valuable life lessons that seem too important to surrender to its centuries of misinterpretation, thanks in part to a tortured guy from the fourth century named Augustine. It's still a story about the essence of what it is to be human. It's a story about curiosity and where we'd be without it. If it weren't for curiosity, we'd be an entirely different species, or maybe we'd be extinct by now. And it's a story about consciousness, self-consciousness, self-reflective consciousness, and what it means to have choice and responsibility. It's a story about collective learning and our longing to live into that name we gave ourselves, to become the wise creature. Unfortunately, the dominant interpretations of this myth have turned it into a tale of some 
idyllic garden with a villainous snake and a foolish woman and a weak man and a capricious God. And so we've come to read the story as a story of crime and punishment, a story of falling from favor and being punished by a punitive paternal deity. But what if it's not a story of a fall? What if it's actually the story of a rising? What if it's really a story about rising into the potential of what it is to be human? What if it's a story that honors curiosity that leads to a new kind of consciousness and makes us a creative and adaptive, knowledge-hungry, wisdom-thirsty creature? We can hear this Eden story as a once upon a tale where the creatures gave in to their curiosity and gave up their dependence and became the creative creature that sets out to live truly and humanly in the world ever after. Like every archetypal story and unlike every fairy tale, it's not about a quest to live forever. It isn't even about a quest to live happily ever after. It's about a quest to taste and know life fully enough to live it truly. If you taste of the fruit of this tree, this tree you're so curious about, you'll know something more, something new, and your eyes will be open to a new consciousness and you'll have a new awareness. You'll know both good and evil. And in the world of the story, she was drawn to the tree because she longed to be discerning and wise. And they ate it together. And their eyes were opened. And they saw themselves as they'd never seen themselves before. And then it wasn't long until their experience of the world expanded from the walled garden to the inexhaustible richness of a world beyond their wildest imaginations. If we will lay down our lenses of seeing this story as a tale of disobedient children and a disappointed and punitive parent, we can recover the story of our evolution. An important story about the way in which the power of curiosity awakens a creativity to learn from life and to learn together, to journey into a new kind of consciousness, into the kind of consciousness that's required to weigh good and evil, good, better, and best, in order to make decisions to be able to do more than just fight or flee. If we see Eve as the heroine of the story instead of the villain, and if we see the serpent as a teacher instead of a trickster, this story invites us to mature as a species, to not only seek and share the knowledge that we can gather, but also to become wise. To not just transmit our collective learning exponentially from generation to generation, but to nurture the kind of ethical consciousness that makes our contribution to life enhancing, not diminishing. This is a story that invites us to evolve ethically and spiritually, to cultivate our curiosity, to be responsible for what we learn, to stand in a consciousness of our naked vulnerability, 
to know ourselves not as the apex of creation or the dominant species or the brightest or the best or the boss of it all, but to remember our identity as one shining expression of life's creativity infused with the wisdom of our finitude and the humility to be a creature that uses its knowledge in the service of the community of life of which we're part of, to be spiritual beings in a human experience. In the world of the poet, this being human, he said, is a guest house. This being human is to be home to many guests, and be grateful for whoever comes, because each is sent as a guide from beyond. In the experience of the poet, to be human is to be a gracious host for life, a thinking, feeling being, receiving all that we know, and letting that experience instruct us in the art of living in the great work of becoming human. There's something long and old and deep in us. There's much in our cosmic and creaturely experience that calls us to live into the potential of being human, of being a gracious host, of becoming home to a goodness-seeking consciousness with the capacity to learn from every thought and feeling, and experience, and to somehow distill our learning into a wisdom that can shape an ethic to live compassionately, and with that ethic to govern our expanding knowledge. So here we are. Evolutionary miracles of competition and cooperation with the potential to become human, to expand our conscience, our consciousness, our conscientiousness, that we can repay our debt to survival with these values we see around us, with love and honesty and wisdom and respect and humility and courage and truth. But it begins in remembering who we are. We've been encouraging each of us to create a space in our homes as we make our way through this four-part series with one another to place symbols of our identity as reminders of who we are. Last week, Chris and Allison shared symbols of the cosmic identity Allison placed water on the table, and also wheat, 
water connecting us with what most of our bodies is and what most of our planet is. Water that we drink each day from the North Saskatchewan River. And wheat, the substance of life, and for her, her connection to her ancestry in the Ukraine and in Saskatchewan growing up in her grandparents' generation on a farm in southern Saskatchewan. Chris placed the cosmic story in um, the Big Bang bead from summer camp a few years ago when he dressed up as the universe <laughs> and told the story of our becoming. And today we think about symbols of our human identity, what it is to be the human species. And I invite you to think about what it is that you might place in your home to remind you of the invitation to be the deepest and most authentic expression of humanness that you can be. I've placed this Inukshuk, a Karen, a duck we find on hiking trails, this marker, not only as a symbol of the accumulation of our experience and that which points our way, but perhaps that it might invite me into the kind of ethic we've been speaking about, that we might not just represent the accumulation of our knowledge, but might point to an ethic, a direction that's life-sustaining in which we as a species can go. I invite you to think about what represents your human presence, your humanity, your evolving consciousness as something that you place as a reminder. I'm wondering if we can return to the singing of it's in every one of us to be wise as we bring back the story that we've reflected on and we bring back the wisdom that we've heard in children's literature, in a mystic, the words of the mystic Rumi, in a reflection on science, and in this ancient myth that invites us into wisdom. And if we might sing once again with each other, it's in every one of us to be wise. Thank you for all the ways that you support us. Each year we designate a certain amount of money to contribute to the Mission and Service Fund that Gail has spoken to us about. Last year our contribution was $32,000. That comes from the givings that each of you contribute in one of these ways. We take time in this moment to think about all that we value, all that we support with our effort, our energies, our commitments, and we sing about that.
to all we believe is true, to all we deeply value, we commit ourselves anew. We go carrying the light that began it all, the light that is within us, between us, among us, and beyond us. We go to point the way for one another and for those who will follow us to be the species that offers an ethical direction of compassion that makes life sustainable in this place. We go together to grow in our consciousness as we travel through life with one another. Christopher, thanks for watching this video. If you want to uh, watch last week's video, click this button right here. If, uh, if you can manage it and can donate to SSUC to help us continue this uh, video page, click right here. And for any information that you want about SSUC and our programs, visit our website right there.